You're listening to Encounters live from 1 Mill Street in Leamington Spa. Uh, my name is Luke Robert Mason, a postgraduate student at the University of Warwick, and my guest today is Professor Steve Fuller, Emeritus Professor of Social Epistemology emeritus. at the U uh, Oh, sorry, no, just Professor. I'm not emeritus. One day, maybe. Uh, you'll get the office and the <laughs> library card ad infinitum. Uh, today, we're going to discuss uh, some of the ideas in his new book, Back to the University's Future, The Second Coming of Humboldt, which outlines how we might retrieve the Enlightenment mission of the university as a place that encourages free expression and the translation and publicity of new forms of knowledge. In other words, a place where students are encouraged to dare to know. So, Steve, I guess my first question is, why do we need to look backwards to look forwards towards the future of the university? Well, first of all, um I would say that the uh, that we still, in a way, pay lip service to what the original modern idea of the university is, and this is what's associated with this guy Humboldt, who I'll say something a little bit about later. But um, when we talk about the the academic and and the pers the persona of the academic, we talk about someone who is a, a teacher and a researcher at the same time, and in that sense, and 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 somehow that combination of functions is somehow meant to be a kind of role model for what it's like to be a kind of rational critical inquirer in society at large. And, and that's kind of what the modern image of the academic in the university is, which this guy Humboldt, who was a Prussian education minister in the early 19th century, uh, put forward in Berlin and became the basis for the University of Berlin, which was kind of the flagship modern university for, for more than a century, actually. And so what we're talking about, so what does that mean exactly? What does it mean to be both a teacher and a researcher at the same time? Well, it means, first of all, that you're open-minded because uh, what you're teaching isn't something that's a closed issue. It's something that, in fact, you're continuing to research on, right? And you have to convey that kind of mentality to the students because that's what you want the students in, at the end of the day to learn and to imitate. Not the, they, it's not so much about the content of what you say, but it's kind of the attitude that you have toward what you say and the fact that there are these kind of open horizons. So even though in a sense we think that we've established certain kinds of things, there's still a, a real open world there, which in a way is meant to be an invitation for the students to become researchers themselves in their own lives, however they pursue that. So this idea of learning through mimesis is interesting, Steve, because one of the reasons I, I still attend your lectures as your PhD supervisor is because they, they are these improvisational presentations of ideas. If anyone's seen Steve lecture, he doesn't use notes, he doesn't use PowerPoint, he just turns up and delivers. I have actually seen you do public engagement events. Where you, as you're walking up onto stage, you look at the organizer and go, how long have I got? And they go, 20 minutes, and you go, fine. And you go for 20 minutes. And you end. And I asked you once, I'm not sure if you remember this, I asked you once, how did you learn to do that? And you looked at me with a wry smile and went, Jesuit education. Yeah, actually, that's in the book. Uh, <laughs> I know. So if you, right, right. Uh, I mean, so, so part of what goes on in the book is not just a, a justification of this sort of ideal that I've been talking about, but also kind of how you do it, yeah. right? Um, and, and I do think that's really an important thing because, you know, the objection to PowerPoint uh, that I have, and it, it runs through the book, uh, is the fact that in a, in a sense, the personality of the academic drops out. And so in a sense, almost anyone could be teaching you the stuff if it's only about content delivery. And that in a way explains a lot of how our universities are operating today, which if you're you know if you're familiar with the way universities are operating, increasingly we're, we're dealing with uh, staff that are sort of short term and they're sort of recycling material. Uh, and there isn't really this kind of long-term, even lifelong commitment uh, to learning right, which an academic needs to have. I mean, one of the things that's interesting about Humboldt in this context, because he's also the man who's responsible for formulating the ideal of academic freedom as we understand it. He's also part of that kind of mentality. And his, uh, his phrase for, uh, you know, for, for academic freedom um, was, uh, 
Lehrfreiheit und Lernfreiheit. In other words, the freedom to teach and the freedom to learn. And for him, research was about learning. And in a sense, right, when, when academics talk about the kind of current work they're doing and how it's pushing forward the frontiers of knowledge, right, they're presenting that as a form of learning that they themselves are doing, right? So the kind of learning that you have, right, it's, it's not just learning to do well on the exam, but it's rather a kind of learning for life that, that is always open uh, to new possibilities in the future. And that is what the academic needs to get across in the classroom. And that was the original Humboldtian idea, which was an incredibly dynamizing force in enabling Germany to rise to the top rank of nations after being kind of a backwater, right? I mean, I think this is one of the things that people don't realize, right? If we're going to, if we're talking about the early 19th century in Europe, Germany is just a bunch of principalities. It's a kind of intellectual backwater to a large extent. And it's through the modern university that it that the talent got galvanized and largely the academics were performing this kind of leadership role. So, so what historically made the university at that time such a revolutionary place? And how do we perhaps retrieve some of that way of doing things? Well, I think the key thing here is if you're looking at the, the, the turn of from the 18th century to the 19th century, the period of revolution, right, the French Revolution in particular, right, you see an enormous disenchantment uh, with established institutions, including universities as they were then, mm. right? Uh, and, and these were basically religious-based institutions, uh, uh, and they were institutions that one went to, and one can think about Oxford and Cambridge exactly in this mold, by the way, um, as institutions you went into to enter into various forms of what you we might call, generally speaking, administration, whether it's administration of the soul through theology or administration of the body through medicine or administration of the polis uh, through law, right? Those were the primary uh, sort of uh, reasons why one would go to university would be to reproduce the social order in its various forms. Um, and so the university itself was not seen as a place of enlightenment, to use that 18th century phrase. In fact, all the enlightenment was going on outside the university. And in fact, that had been largely the case actually since the 17th century with during the period that we call the scientific revolution. So that somebody like Newton, who was a professor of mathematics at Cambridge, was more the exception than the rule with regard to the people who in fact made the big scientific breakthroughs in the 17th and the 18th centuries. So the universities were bastions of the establishment, bastions of tradition, right, where people were being taught the same thing over and over and over again. And so the question becomes then, is the university itself as an institution part of the problem. A lot of the Enlightenment figures definitely thought so. They thought the university ought to be got rid of. And that's where Humboldt is interesting because he reinvents the university where he makes the teaching and the research function kind of, you know, kind of reciprocal, right, in a way. And he creates this new academic personality who's not just an establishment figure, but is rather a vanguard figure. So are we there again? I mean, uh, Rishi Sunak has, has famously said that uh, people are going to university for these Mickey Mouse uh, degrees. Or, well, he's or, right about that. Uh, <laughs> well, what do you mean by that? Uh, <laughs> but are we at that same sort of question mark over the point of the university in the 20, uh, well, early 21st century? And how do we find a Humboldtian-esque figure to, to argue the importance of it? Well, I think the university has got itself into a a, a royal mess, let's put it that way, um, because basically it's become sort of trying to become all things to all people. Uh, and as a result, as a result, it's sort of hollowed out its own soul. Uh, so the university is going to be the place that is going to, uh, you know, as we're trained people for the jobs of the future. Right. Universities are promising to do that. Right. Universities are promising to do the kind of research that industry is going to like and all that. Right. Uh, and as a result, what you get now, the kind of people who are being hired in universities are quite a motley crew of people who, in a way, might be functionally good at certain kinds of things, but it by no means embody kind of the uh, ideal of an academic as a personality. So if I have to say what's you know, how do you. How do you know that the, that the soul of the university is lost is that there's nothing admirable about the academic personality. 
right? I mean, academics are just guys who run around trying to get grants, right? Uh, you know, or look for, for leave time whenever they can to go somewhere else. I mean, this is kind of the, the, the career trajectory of the contemporary academic, right? There is no sense of an academic ethos anymore. Uh, and, 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 and so, and this, and, and the people who, who lack this academic ethos are successful, right? In the sense that they get high salaries, right? That, that, you know, uh, they're regarded as consultants and you know uh, and so well there is a real crisis as it were in terms of the academic identity and so it is not surprising that students politicians and other people are actually quite skeptical and even cynical about the future of the university so, so what can be done to to save the future of the university steve i mean how do we refashion the perception both internally and externally of what is possible at these sorts of institutions well i think this is actually really tough issue, to be honest with you. And, and I think the current state of the university, where we have so many of them, and they're claiming to do all things for all people, that is not sustainable. So there is going to be self-destruction, I think, in terms of the higher education sector, right? It's going to collapse, right? Because after a while, people are going to start holding universities accountable to, for all these miracles they claim to perform, which they cannot perform, right? And so then at that point, people are going to have to start thinking about why do we need universities at all? And then they're going to go back to the foundational values of the kind that I'm talking about in the book. But there will be a kind of collapse that will have to take place, I think. There will have to be a crisis because people are not going to be paying the tuition fees they're currently paying for what little they actually get because universities overpromise things they never were, should have been in the business of doing in the first place. Right. And so this is real. The, 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 so the crisis of the university is going to come from within. The corruption is going to lead to collapse. And then there will be an opportunity, kind of like the Protestant Reformation after the after the collapse of the Catholic Church. Right. From all the corruption that was there, where there can be kind of a rebuilding. Right. Um, and of course, there will be some institutions that will survive, of course, because in a sense, they still have enough of the values and there's still enough of a commitment to it. But I think a lot of the current institutions are going to be in serious trouble. And there's a sense in which we should let them be in trouble and see whether they survive or not. All right. I feel like I'm going to be in trouble uh, after, <laughs> after this conversation. Uh, I'm sorry, the university. Uh, don't worry. <laughs> it's your engagement. But... Uh, <laughs> But Steve, you are, you are an academic at the University of Warwick. What do you think an institution like Warwick does particularly well that maybe we want to, uh, that maybe we want to uh, I, I have not amplify? Mentioned, I, have not, I have not mentioned Warwick at all here, actually. Yeah. Um, I, I think the fact that I'm still around after 24 years uh, is, 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 I mean, I, I do think that that is a, a kind of an important issue, right? The ability of academics to be able to find their way in the system and to be able to play to their strengths, okay? Um, because we obviously live uh, in, in, a, in an academic culture where uh, to re be regarded as a kind of high status member of academia, you have to be a big, big grant getter, for example. And getting grants means that you have to be chasing the trends, whether the trends are within academia or they're in industry or wherever the money is, as it were, for, to support academic research. Um, but the question then is, suppose you're not in that game. Suppose you didn't go into academia for that reason, as I didn't go into it for that reason. If I wanted to make money, I would have gone into business, frankly. I don't know why, you know, people want to go into academia to make a lot of money. Uh, but that does seem to be kind of something that drives a lot of, uh, of what people do these days. But the question is, how many people can survive without doing that? Right. How many people can keep regular academic posts by doing just the, the 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 sort of classic Humboldtian stuff of teaching and research without having to get involved in the money business? I think that is kind of the way you measure the value of a university these days is by how many of those people you have on regular contracts, because the problem is we are casualizing both the teaching and the research side to such a large extent. Right. That nobody is actually encouraged, as it were, to think of a lifelong career that might be in those areas. Well, what, one of the ways the universities are, I guess, judged is the research excellence framework, which is coming up in about four years. How do you think that landscape is going to change? Um, I mean, we could have a Labour government in you know, two years. That may change how REF is viewed or, or, or will be rolled out. Uh, what do you think REF does to help a university uh, or help hinder a university <laughs> to, uh, to uh, generate its identity, I guess? Well, uh, look, I think the uh, research excellence framework uh, was always kind of based on a sort of false premise in a sense that in some sense, 
the way you actually show that academics are, are, re, are research active is by looking at how much they're publishing, right, and where they're publishing it. And I think what that has done in effect, and now the REF has been around for uh, over 30 years, uh, that it has basically uh, kind of strengthened, in a sense, certain kinds of disciplinary identities, because if you know anything about the uh, research excellence framework, basically you have committees of people from particular academic disciplines who judge the work of the people in all the different universities. And so it sort of reinforces disciplinary boundaries and stuff like that, and it tends to reinforce whatever happens to be kind of the current trends in academic fields. And one of the problems that we have with academic research in general, if you look at it kind of from a, a kind of holistic, so sociological standpoint is that, uh, in fact, uh, most of the stuff that enormous amounts of stuff is being published all over the place, uh, but most of it is actually systematically ignored uh, because it is not contributing to what are regarded as the cutting edge areas. And you see the ref in a way reinforces that kind of cutting edge mentality where the only people who matter or the people who matter the most are the ones who are doing the things that all the big guys say you ought to be doing, right? And so the whole idea of free inquiry, the idea that you follow the truth wherever it may lead, right, which is which was very much part of the humble Boltian idea of the university, that falls by the wayside because, in fact, most of the people who do follow, you know, the truth wherever it may lead get ignored, mm. right? And they're not highly valued in the ref. Um, and, and I think, again, the ref, I think, will eventually, it'll stop. Uh, be, it'll stop because, in a sense, this has become such a game that the outcomes of the ref in terms of what universities do well is fairly predictable now. Mm. And, and you know, in that sense, it's become so routinized that – but nevertheless, it costs an enormous amount of money to administer. So it's a great money waster, okay? It's a great money waster and time waster for academics. And I think once we actually – you know, we, we, we get all these various governments, these various neoliberal governments that, that are really interested in cutting, cut, cutting costs – and, and efficiency savings, well, REF would be one kill REF, right? And that would be a great efficiency saving because you, you it costs a lot of money and the outcomes you get are pretty predictable before you start. Um, and, and I think that would be, you know, if, if people really had a kind of, you know, you used a kind of economically steely eye on REF, they'd realize it's not value for money. The exercise is not value for money. End it on those grounds alone, even if you don't buy the more, you know, exalted kind of intellectual grounds I, I would be promoting. On, on sheer efficiency savings, you should cut it. Not, not to be self-referential to the event that we're doing now, but where does things like public engagement figure in the promotion of ideas that you're talking about in that book? Well, so the idea here, one of the things that I say about teaching, because again, right, if you think about this Humboldtian idea, the freedom to teach and the freedom to learn, it's clearly that that teaching in a way is the is the key university function and research is a is as it were the learning side of teaching, right? That's that's, that's how he looked at it, right? Research is in some separate thing. Um and and I think Part of what he has in mind, what Humboldt had in mind, and what I think turned out to be incredibly influential in terms of the enlightenment function of the university over the past couple of centuries, uh, is the idea that um, when you teach something, right, the, 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 the subject that you're teaching in a way that you learn it as a professional academic is, is of course, uh, highly technical in a way, right? You read these technical textbooks, the technical journal articles, books, and stuff like that. Um, and and in a sense, you have become one of the you have become like the people whose books you read, right? When you become a professional academic. But the point is that the people who are in the classroom aren't those people, right? The people in the classroom have not had that kind of exposure to the technical technical language and the training and so forth. And so what you have to do is uh, you have to, as it were, uh, teach it to them from scratch, right? So teach it to them starting from their level. So in a sense, you have to, as it were, uh, you know technically disarm yourself in a certain ex to a certain extent right you know so this is why it's always very lazy teaching um for academics to insist that people have to put stuff in a certain kind of way they have to write in a certain kind of way they have to you have to use the jargon of, of a particular theorist or something like that in order to do well rather the the burden is on the academic to actually make the stuff that they think is important right important to the students 
right? And 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 that is so. In that respect, teaching is a public engagement activity. And so, the kind of thing that you know we're doing right now here is, in a sense, not so very different from what I feel does need to be done in the classroom every day, because students do need to be persuaded that what they're being taught isn't just something they're forced to be taught, right? But rather, it is something they ought to want to learn. Right. Uh, and, and so that is where the teaching moves into the public engagement realm. And so this is why I talk about in the book, teaching is a kind of endless process of translation. Right. It is translating from the technical to the less technical so that people who were not part of the original culture from which the research was done is nevertheless. They're nevertheless able to have it and use it for their own purposes, will ma which may take those ideas and findings in directions radically different from those who came up with them. And that is actually part of the democratizing function of the university in terms of the larger society so that you don't have to just reproduce the past. You can take these ideas and push them in new directions. Well, the, the lazy teaching engenders lazy learning. So what can we learn from plagiarism and chat GTP, the use of that by students, Steve? Well, you know, uh, as, as some of you may know, uh, with, with, especially with the chat GPT thing, um, right, academics are, are hysterical about this, right? What is it going to do, right? Um, and um, one of the things that, you know, so just, you know, for those of you who, uh, who aren't all that familiar with it, right? Uh, it's a kind of a generative artificial intelligence program, right? Where you can put a question in, you know, like an, like, let's say an exam question or an essay question, and you get a little essay, right? And, and very often the essay, I would say is kind of, you know, kind of two one-ish, you know, in terms of its quality. So it's, it's, it's not a first. It's still it, a two one. Yeah, right. No, exactly. No, 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 exactly. No, that's the point. That's the point. And, and so in that, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, often there are errors of fact, as people have pointed out about ChatGPT, but you should read student essays, right? People can get two ones in student essays and still have a couple of errors in them, right? So in this respect, if we're talking about real human performance compared to ChatGPT, right, two one is kind of the ballpark. Now, when I look at that, Right. Um, I, I'm not too scared because actually the kinds of questions that I ask students are actually very hard to generate decent ch chat GPT answers to. OK, I ask kind of more imaginative questions, creative questions. Right. Where 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 it is you, you your chat GPT answer wouldn't be so, you know, uh, so impressive. But if you're asking textbook style questions. And, and again, you got to look at what academics actually ask students to produce in their exams and essays. Very often, they're at that kind of Mickey Mouse textbook level because they're easier to mark, right? You can tell what's right and what's wrong, and an academic doesn't want to spend too much time evaluating student papers, right? So you tend to Mickey Mouse it. Well, if you Mickey Mouse it, ChatGPT wins, yeah. right? And this is why academics are so much up in arms about it. But if academics raise their game in terms of what they expect out of their students, then ChatGPT wouldn't be such a big thing. Yeah. So Steve runs a um, Steve runs a module called uh, Sociology of End Times, which is about the apocalypse. It's ten le ten weeks of lectures about the apocalypse, everything from the end of the world to uh, Ted Kaczynski. And the the essay question is: Should the world begin anew? And Steve actually gives the students the chat GTP answers to that. Um, there's one last question that I want to ask you, Steve, which is: uh, Despite all these things, you have established a method for effective learning. You call them the three oh, yeah. R's, Rome, record, rehearse. And, and that's, a, that's a lesson that anybody here can take when they're interested in an idea. So could you just very quickly explain what the three R's okay, are? Okay, this goes back so to my teenage years in New York when I was a student of Jesuits and all that jazz. Um, so the thing is, I used to go to bookshops a lot. That's the roaming part, right? The browsing, right? Um, and and of course, uh, in to a, to a large extent, uh, this kind of function is not so spontaneous anymore because of our computer-based culture, which actually allows us to make much more targeted searches. So we actually end up not exposing ourselves to as much different stuff as we used to when we used to have to go to a bookshop and actually, you know, browse the shelves and see what's cooking, right? And that's the roaming part, you know, in brief terms, right? And the record part was I t always took a lot of notes on what I read, right? I always took a lot of notes. And in fact, um, while I sometimes did marginal notes, I actually generally speaking, had notebooks because I wanted to get my my sense of what I was reading down in a relatively clear fashion, right? So so it's not just parasitic on what I happen to be reading at the moment. So I have actually a lot of notebooks. I still have them, right? That's the record part. And then the rehearse part, uh, that's really important from the standpoint of, of this kind of teaching more public side of things because I think you need to know your own mind, 
right? Uh, and that's why it's really important. And I think, you know, the great actors also do this as well, right? That in a sense, you know, if you're thinking about something, you know, you, you, you run it through your mind. You kind of talk to yourself in a way, right? You sort of act it out. I mean, I do a lot of that, right? So, so uh, you know, so even though in a sense, you know, some people think I just walk into the classroom and I'm just, you know, it's all boom, you know, but nevertheless, all this stuff has been roaming around, you know, it's been in my mind for a long time and I've run through many possibilities. And so when I walk into a classroom, I have a sense of the kinds of things I need to say by the end of the hour, but the order in which they're said, how they're developed and so forth, right, are subject to a, a lot of possible changes, right? Because in a sense, I have something like a map of different ways of playing it out in my mind, right? And that's the rehearsal part. And that's something that just, I would say, is kind of, you know, you might say sort of the background working conditions of, of, of being an academic. At least that's how I look at it. And so this is why all this stuff like PowerPoints and things like that, to me, seems really bush league, really, really unprofessional kind of stuff. It, it's like you don't know what you're doing. Right. When people are lip syncing to PowerPoints and they have PhDs in the subject, unless you're unless you're talking about really technical mathematical equations, I don't see the point. And this is why we're doing what we're doing today. So you've been listening to Encounters live from One Mill Street in Leamington Spa. This event has been supported by Resonate, a project by the University of Warwick Institute for Engagement at the University of Warwick. My name is Luke Robert Mason. Please join me in thanking the inspiring Professor Steve Fuller. Thank you. Thank you.